also we pray for those on our prayer list and continue to remember them in your prayers, those of our church family that's had loved ones to pass away. There will be no Sunday school this morning, so please remember that. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for your love and your mercy. And Lord, we thank you that you have allowed us to be here this morning. Lord, thank you for clearing the roads. And we pray for those, Lord, that, that are without power. We pray, Lord, for those that are traveling. We pray for those that are battling cancer and other diseases. And Lord, we pray for those that are convalescent at their own homes and also those, Lord, that are in nursing homes or hospitals or wherever they may be. We lift them up to you this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Ready?
he was lost and is found. And they began to be in be merry. Now, if you read further in that scripture, you have the elder son who stayed home and continued to, to work with his father and work for his father. And when he got word that his younger brother, who had wasted everything that he had, he got mad. Now, I want you to hear this. This older brother typified a lot of church folk. They're in the church, but they steal a problem. The things of God no longer move them or excite them. And they began to have a judgmental spirit as this uh, older brother did. He didn't even address him as his brother. He said to his father, your son. So that means he had automatically cut him out of his life or any fellowship with him whatsoever. So you have two problems. You have the prodigal outside of the church and you have the prodigal in the church. Which is easier to win back? Why the scriptures very plain? The one that is outside of the church. I wanted to explain that to bring you to the point of what the prodigal didn't lose when he was in the far country, when he was living in the world. And I believe this message will encourage parents that may have a prodigal themselves that are out in the world. They're saved, but they got away from God. God has not left them. So therefore, they're in the far country. And I hope this message encourages those that are listening that may have a son or a daughter that is in the far country. And my friends, being in the far country is not a good thing. There are so many things that happen to this young, young man that he realized that he needed the Lord. First of all, the prodigal did not lose his direction back home. Hmm. Man, that's not. The prodigal did not lose his direction back home. Look at verse 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance and pride of living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in war. And he joined himself to the citizen of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed the swine. He didn't lose his way back home. And I want to say to parents that are listening by Facebook, and you this morning, you may have a prodigal in your family. Just remember this, and I've heard testimony after testimony of many a person that got out into the world, and what really brought them back was a sense of repentance, but knowing that they had parents at home that prayed for them continually. Not just every once in a while, but lifted up their names daily. This prodigal did not lose his direction back home while he was in the far country. I wonder this morning how many people that used to be involved in the life of the church that are in the far country today. They've somehow lost their way. They've allowed the, the, the things of this world to literally suffocate them. And they're living in the far country. You may be here today yourself and you say, Pastor, I was in the far country at one time. And God had to bring me to my senses, and I knew that I could go back home. Sometimes, folks, God will let an individual get in the place 
in the hog pit of life where they can't stand the stench that is on them before they will come to themselves. Number two, bound in verse 17, this prodigal didn't lose while he was in the far country the dictates of his conscience. Look at verse 17. And when he came to himself, where was he when he came to himself? Where was he at? He was in the hog pen. And repentance is coming to oneself, realizing that they have sinned against God, they have sinned against their family, and their conscience drives them back home. He did not lose the dictates of his conscience. That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way it should go. And when he is what? When he is what? When he is old. When he is old, he shall return to those things. And my friend, that is a promise, and that has bought many a father and mother a lot of comfort down through the years when their child is out there in the park country living like the devil. And they know that they have been taught the ways of God. My friend, many a parent has drawn comfort that when they lay down at night and their head on the pillow and their son or their daughter or their grandson or their granddaughter is in the far country, that they did the very best. Now, let me say this to parents that don't care what their kids do. It will come back to haunt you. The fathers has eaten sour grapes the scripture said, and the children's teeth are set on edge. He didn't lose his direction back home. He didn't lose the dictates of his conscience. He realized his true attitude towards sin, but he had to get in the hall of pen and get to the place that he could not stand the stench of sin on him and then he turned around. He didn't repent to some extent that he would be saved to some degree. He truly repented, repented, and went back home. Number three, found in verse 18. He did not lose his desire to return. He knew that he could go back home. He knew that. He knew in his heart of hearts that he could go back home. I read an article, it's probably been 35 years ago, about a, a, a lady that grew up here. She went to New York and, and worked there for many, many years. And the local newspaper interviewed her because she had done well with her. And she said something in that article that has stuck in my spirit those 30 some years. She said this, some people can go home. Some people can't go home. And some people want to go home. Well, he realized his desire to return. He says, he said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, my father. Now notice this. I'm going to point out something. I have sinned against thee and against him. He did not one time try to excuse his behavior. Like so many children do today when they do something wrong and, and they want to blame everybody else. You know, well, so-and-so made me do it. Or, or it was just a weak moment. It's, it's funny how people try to excuse their sin. Well, so-and-so made me. 
Can't anyone make you sin against God? No one can make a person sin against God. But he did not lose his desire to go back home. He had strong feelings about his life. Strange fears about his sinful ways. And struggled with the fact about his loving parents. We read this discourse of scripture. We glean the meaning of this scripture. Yet and still there are people that are determined to do things that way. He didn't lose his desire to return. I'm so thankful to declare to you this morning that I knew that I could always go back home. I could always go back home. Many children or many adults, young adults can say that. Because when they left, they burned all the bridges. This prodigal didn't lose his desire to return, nor did he lose his determination to get out of the hall again. He was determined that he was going to get out of the plight or the hand that had been dealt to him. And folks, determination and perseverance will make you and will turn you around and cause you to do the right thing. This morning, I'm going to take the liberty to say this because I feel like what I'm saying is from the Holy Spirit. There are people that are in the four walls of the church Sunday after Sunday that are prodigals. This week, as I was working on this message, it just got into more things over my spirit. And I was sad when I, I began to think about a lot of young people from this church as wonder in the far country. You see it, look on Facebook. You see it with your naked eye. That has strayed away from what they were taught. I want to say this, parents don't ever excuse the wicked behavior of your children. Don't ever excuse them. And don't try to play the blame game on someone else. He had a determination to get out of the hall in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But he was yet a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I think I need to say this. There were about eight years in my life, young adult life, that I was a problem. I never stopped attending church. My cousin, here this morning in America. I never stopped going to church. But I was a prodigal. And I'll never forget in March of 1975, God spoke to my spirit. He didn't speak to me in the hall of holiness. And he said, you need to stop playing games. And in March of 1975, I repented. And I said, Lord, I want to walk closer to thee. Please forgive me. I was a prodigal in the church for about eight years. And 
That's why I knew that I was eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Spirit spoke to me so strong. It said, you need to stop playing games. There's a lot of people that are playing games. I mean, I was doing all the right things. I got dressed for my coat and tied in church. But I knew that I wasn't living like God wanted me to live. And I'm so thankful that he didn't take his hand off of me. I'm talking to somebody this morning. You may be here in this building. You're in the far country, but you're in the church. I love this next part. He didn't lose his devotion of his father's relationship. God, what a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a shadow of time. He realized in the hall of men that he could go back home. But he didn't go back making excuses. He went back humble. He left proud, but he went back humble. That reminds me of a story that was shared in one of my preaching classes at seminary. That was this young candidate for a church to become the pastor. And he had prepared that week. And he had everything in place. He had an element of pride. Among the congregation was an older minister. So this young man goes up into the pulpit with pride in his heart. He said, I got it together. I prepared my sermon. I got it. Now I'm going to pick. I'm, I'm going to preach it. Well, he goes up into the pulpit and he makes some blunder. Did anything come out correct? And he went down with his head tucked. And that old minister said this to him. Said, if you had went up like you come down, you could have come down like you went up. Pride. The Bible says, pride goeth before destruction in a haughty spirit before a fall. He didn't lose his devotion, nor did he lose his distinction between good and evil. Verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. He never lost his distinction between good and evil. Right now, in our country, there are people that cannot discern between right and wrong because they have lived in so many great areas of their life that they have no discernment what is right and what is wrong. If you don't believe it, look at the news. No distinction between right and wrong. You can take black and white paint and mix it together and you get great paint. A lot of people are living in great areas of their life because they have never made a distinction between right and wrong. My friends, the word of God never changes. It was what he said, he meant in the word of God, and God has not changed his mind about it yet. And lastly, verse 22 through 24. 
But the father said unto his servant, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, which is analogous to or symbolic of royalty. And bring the hither, fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For my, my son was dead, and is alive again, was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. He did not lose his delight of his reunion with his father. He did not lose. He knew that he could go back home. And somehow or another, he knew deep down, even when he cried out to his father, make me as one of thy servants, that his father, was going to rejoice and love him through it. I want to say this. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. That does not mean that love excuses sin. It does not excuse sin. But love covers a multitude of sin. Where are you at today, spiritually? Are you in the park, don't you? May we pray. Father, thank you for the privilege this morning to be at the house of God. Thank you for those that have assembled here to hear the songs of Zion sung and the word of God preached. Lord, if it's one here that has not trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that they would come to know me, that they would seek out myself or another pastor here or, or any lay person that can show them the plan of salvation, how to be saved. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the all-wise God, both power and dominion, both now and forevermore. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Be safe.